from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. It has been our pleasure over the years to bring you a number of programs about countries around the world, and uh, for many, many years we have been doing that. Today we'd like to visit one of those countries, in fact, one that we have never discussed on this program before in the 23 years that we've been broadcasting. Today, uh, please come with us to the country of Bolivia. Uh, we will describe this as life in Bolivia. We're very fortunate to have as our guest a person who recently was there and has gr graciously consented to be with us. Our guest is Jeannie Givens. Uh, she went to Bolivia as a board member of Americans for Indian Opportunity. She and other members of her organization were invited by the Vice President of Bolivia to visit with them, and so she got some very special insights uh, in doing that. Our guest is also the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees at North Idaho College, as a former member of the Idaho Legislature. I should add that she does a column every two weeks uh, for the Idaho Statesman, and in one of her recent columns, she did Bolivia, and Jeannie, that was the most informative article, and we welcome you and happy to have you with us today. Thank you. And as always, I'm very pleased to have our two regular panelists to uh, join in questioning our guest today. First of all is Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and I shall ask Janelle to commence our questioning about Bolivia today. Jeannie, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and we're anxious to hear about your trip. Uh, what was the purpose for which you went? Our delegation from Americans for Indian Opportunity was invited by the vice president of the country, the newly elected vice president. His name is Victor Cardenas, and he was recently elected last January, and he is part of a coalition ticket that was legally elected in free and open elections, so we were very enthusiastic to be his guest. The reason why he chose our organization is that he had formulated a friendship with the president of our, our group, LaDonna Harris of Americans for Indian Opportunity. He is the first native Indian person ever elected in Bolivia. So we were very proud of his election and we wanted to be a part of it. So, Well, I know that you had a, a, had a wonderful time while you were there. Would you show us where it, exactly you went? You have brought a map with you today. Would you show us exactly where Bolivia is and uh, where you went while you were in Bolivia? Bolivia is south of Brazil. It is a large country of about seven million people. And of these people, three quarters of the population is native Indian, or they call themselves the indigenous people of the area. We visited La Paz, and we were there for about four days. And then we moved over here to Trinidad, which is in the Amazon Basin area. This is the jungle area. Then we returned back to La Paz. La Paz is the capital of, of Bolivia, and Sucre down here is the judicial capital. We made a side trip to Lake uh, Titicaca, and we visited some Mayan ruins along the, uh, the lake. Well, Bolivia, I'm sure, is a very old country, and they're, they're, uh, people have been there for, for a long time, so you probably learned something about that. And, and what can you tell us, just as a beginning? The uh -huh. civilization in what is now Bolivia is a very, very old, old civilization. The Inca Indians settled in this area. When we visited a place called Tio Tanaka, uh, we visited ancient Inca ruins that have been there for thousands of years. The indication that the, uh, the guide gave us was that this civilization was thriving. It was uh, uh, doing very well producing producing a lot of agricultural crops and, and conducting trade within what is now Bolivia and out to other populations near Peru. And then a drought came, and we understand that it was about a hundred year drought, and people left the area and the ruins began to crumble. So that's about all we know about it, but it was a very special place. And from the Inca civilization, two strong major Indian groups are within Bolivia the Ayamara of the lowlands and the Quechuan of the highlands. Steve Sheen. 
I, I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about the log logistics, Jeannie, of, of getting there. It was a pretty arduous process, wasn't it, for you j just to get to Bolivia in the first place? We flew on a Saturday from Seattle in the morning and arrived to Miami at about 6 in the evening and then caught a midnight flight from Miami, flew seven hours to La Paz. We, we walked off the airplane and were astounded by the shortage of oxygen and the, the effects of altitude discomfort and sickness took over immediately. We just were not used to such thin air. Uh, the altitude in La Paz is, is 12,500 feet, so it is very, very high. It is about as high as Mount Rainier, so we were not physically prepared for that. But, but gradually you can become acclimated to it, and the, rule that they, the, the rules that they give you is to take it easy, don't walk around too much, and uh, don't exert yourself, and don't eat too much. So we tried to follow those rules. Sounds like, sounds like not a prescription for having a good time, but tell, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your itinerary. What well, we managed to have a good, good. time. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Our itinerary was, was jam-packed. We have, we have 20 young Indian ambassadors that were traveling with us, and within this program, they served as diplomats uh, to help develop their own leadership abil ability from their tribes visiting as diplomats to visit new Indian people in South America. So these young people were able to meet with government officials. We were, we were presented to the vice president in his vice presidential quarters in the capital. That was a very special, mm -hmm. special event. And uh, the young people from many of the tribes brought gifts, basket, beadwork, and presented that to the vice president. He speaks the, uh, the Ayamara language, and he speaks his native language first, translates to Spanish, then Spanish to English. So it was, it was a long discussion with mm. the, the vice president. He has a very good sense of humor. He is a former professor, and he taught in La Paz at one of the universities. The, the uh, 20 young ambassadors, tribal ambassadors, that, yes. that came, they are not members of the Americans for Indian Opportunity group, or are they? Yes, they are. They're All part right. of our leadership program. We selected 20 young people I to wonder. be part of an ongoing year uh, program to develop leadership skills. And I'm involved with the AIO Board of Directors. Now, what kind of a cross-section of, of uh, tribes and, and geography were represented in, this, in the total group that you sent to Bolivia? We had a, a diverse group of people. We had a tribal chairwoman from uh, the Oneida tribe to a writer from Taos Pueblo to uh, a physician from the Navajo Reservation. We had. Uh, um, a lovely Seneca young lady who is an artist who is now attending Yale uh, getting her uh, masters in fine arts. So we had a very diverse group and we presented our young diplomats too a as we traveled and uh, they had they had an, an incredible experience of course traveling abroad was something that they had never done and uh, also the language difficulties but, but uh, getting close to another culture was, was very exciting for them. Jeannie, we're going to show some other things in a moment, but uh, tell us a, a little bit more about the people of Bolivia. You've indicated about uh, the location of uh, people living in the low areas and the high areas. Now, tell us a little bit about uh, their life and uh, their dress and, uh, and some of their customs. I'd like to share with you uh, a, a depiction in a doll that shows pretty much the typical dress of the native people that live in the highlands. And the Indian women wear shawls, they don't use purses, they carry their belongings in little satchels, wearing flat shoes and uh, full skirts. They adopted the bowler hat, and nobody can, could really explain to us why this bowler hat for the, for the women is part of the native dress. But on every street corner you can see women dressed uh, with, with uh, their braids and the uh, bowler hat on top of the head. The men dress similarly, lots of wool, um, llamas are, are, uh, are in uh, Bolivia, so they have good woolens, and again the satchel, the sandals and hats. Good, warm, sturdy, practical clothing. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the weather uh, and all, uh, of course like everywhere else there are seasons and uh, of course the, the dress would vary depending on the climate. We visited in what would be their springtime. So uh, 
it was it was very cool in the morning, uh, reaching freezing to to in the afternoon reaching up to 60 or 70 degrees. So it was it was a pleasant time to visit. And uh, in the highlands, it's very frosty. In the lowlands, in the Amazon area, we visited that we visited. It was so hot and so humid. I don't know how hot it was, but it was perhaps 95 with 100 percent humidity. And I surely wasn't prepared for for that kind of weather. But uh, lots of mosquitoes and uh, very very damp. I'm going to have the camera take a look at a very special. Uh, gift that you've brought. I mean, it's not a gift to us, but it's a gift to you. Uh, would you tell us what this is from the Vice President uh, and his spouse, I believe? We were at the American Embassy, and Mrs. Cardenas attended in her husband's <coughs> place. I was in my beaded buckskin cordelline tribal dress, and she was in her dress, similar to the doll that I showed you. And I was the only one in native outfit. and. Uh, she she was quite taken by that, so we talked about outfits, and again through this double translation and back and forth. But uh, she was most most charming and very uh, very very wonderful person. I presented her with a Pendleton blanket, which which for our tribe is a very traditional gift to give to a digni dignitary, and she gave me this lovely plaque. And it has the insignia of the country of Bolivia and then a special message from the vice president. So well, I'm, I'm really pretty. proud to have that in my home. Right. Uh, one of the things that one finds out when one goes to uh, countries like this is that there's a sharing of gifts back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Janelle Burke. My inquiry is going to be about the economics of Bolivia. I know that that's a, a prime concern of the Bolivians. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit about how do they make their money? What to, do they do? To take in the picture of what is happening in Bolivia, we need to look at what is happening with all of Latin America. Mm -hmm. The country of Mexico is the jewel in the Latin American crown, and you know what is happening with the devaluation of the peso, and the Mexican stock market is crumbling. Now, if that is the jewel in the crown of Latin America, we know that Bolivia is very, very much further on down the road. In all of Latin America, Bolivia is the one of the poorest countries second only to Haiti. Haiti is the most poor country in all of Latin America. And when we look at indicators that, that define what poverty is about, that means lack of education, uh, health resources, ava availability of health resources, and uh, basic standard of living kinds of issues. So Bolivia is a very poor country. But with the election of the new government, this was the first popularly elected government with free and open elections. Um, there is quite a bit of hope from the three quarters of the Indian people that supported this ticket. Um, they, called, they called it the quiet revolution. There was no bloodshed that took place. But they are pinning their hopes and dreams a and the future of this country on this coalition that is, that is now in place. Um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, Many countries were able to tap into the, to Bolivia's vast mineral wealth. And since then, uh, during the late 80s, they nationalized the tin and other mining in industries. So other countries will not be able to extract their mineral wealth. It will now belong to the Bolivians. Uh, they are a, a strong agricultural country. They produce wheat, barley, potatoes, very similar to Idaho. There is something else that they're dealing with, and I think it's, it's a dilemma. They're in a dilemma, and the cocaine trade is alive and well in Bolivia. Uh, so what we're seeing as far as an American response to helping Bolivia, what we see is, is that we have the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, in the area of Trinidad. Uh, we had helicopters flying over. I mean, we're spending a great deal of money in this anti-drug war. But uh, as far as other kind of assistance, uh, the vice president and his wife are asking for more, for more kinds of assistance to help build a health delivery system, to help build a school system, to help build the standard of living. And true, they, wanna, they want to tackle the drug problem, but they also want some major changes and assistance in developing a, the stability in their society. Steve Sheen. Jeannie, um, you mentioned that, that there are um, two groups of indigenous people, both descended from the Incas 
and they make up about 75 percent of the total population of Bolivia. The other 25 percent is are, are, are what cultural groups? They're they're mostly direct descendants of the Spaniards. However, I met uh, I met many Germans mm -hmm. who have lived in Bolivia for years and years, and uh, uh, met a priest who was a direct immigrant to Bolivia, immigrated to Bolivia from Spain, and. Europeans were all over the place. We saw many Europeans there, so it was. In many uh, uh, Latin American countries, at least it, it's my impression that, that indigenous people are at the bottom of a of sort of a social strata. What, what did you see as the case in, in Bolivia? I would say, I would say definitely uh, two years ago, the bottom rung, these are the people who worked in the mines for mm -hmm. virtually no wages at all. These are the people who worked uh, worked in situations where they were working for landlords to help produce and cultivate the crops for little or no wages. Land reform is taking place in the country. Um, this, this political change is a very big change for the entire country. I think that the writing was on the wall in that uh, they had to do something or there would have been a massive revolution. I don't think within all of Latin America you can keep people impoverished for very long. Sooner or later, they're You've seen throughout Argentina and Brazil and uh, these other countries where there have been massive revolutions. And in Bolivia, within the last 11 years, there were almost nine different administrations. The turnover was very quick. So one came in, served a little while, and they were thrown out. But I think that they want to seek some kind of stability. That is why there was a coalition with the president and the vice president. The vice president had to be a native person. That was the political mm -hmm. solution to prevent um, any bloodshed or, or a major tearing apart of the country. We've talked sort of indirectly about, about the, the government in um, Bolivia. You mentioned that the vice president who, who hosted you at, at several events uh, uh, was a part of a popular election. Um, you mentioned, and this is before the show, so our, uh, our audience hasn't heard this, but one of the things that, that caught uh, my attention was the fact that you said La Paz is the I believe the governmental capital, but there is a there is another judicial capital in in uh, Bolivia. Could you tell us a little more just about the basic structure of government? There? As Bolivia was formed, I think they wanted to divide it into principalities, and so they had the heads of government at at La Paz, and then the judicial area was down in uh, Sucre, which is south of La Paz, and it's lowland in, areas, in a Are, little midland, oh, right. and uh, so. Uh, but but things are changing as well. In order to totally revitalize this entire country, the, the courts, for instance, are, the court documents are written on parchment paper by hand. Mm -hmm. And they have a long way to go before they're ever able to deal with the numerous people who are just sitting in jails because they, they haven't been charged yet with a crime. And that backlog of, of uh, humanity is, is really taking a toll on them. So. Uh, they, the interesting thing that happened during the entire trip, we worked with the Indigenous Fund of Latin America and the Caribbean, and they they put us together with with many groups, many many other groups who are working in Bolivia. For instance, there's a German research group working there to help with indigenous rights. We are hoping that we'll be able to formulate an Indian to Indian flow of technical assistance. So our young Indian leaders can go to Bolivia and spend a period of, say, from two weeks to six months sharing their expertise, our physicians, our nurses, and not really like Peace Corps, but it will be using the advantages that we have to help them prevent the kind of mistakes that we made so that they can achieve their goals of independence. You're, you're so informed. Uh you, again, as we said at the beginning of the program, you had the fortunate opportunity to meet with the vice president and other people that are in decision making and to go out into the country to meet with the general population. And based upon this is more than what many tourists get to do as they, they travel to certain spots. Uh, Jeannie, tell us a, somewhat more about uh, the economic conditions. You've mentioned that there was a lot of poverty in, not only in Bolivia but other countries. Uh, th what I'm attempting to do is to ask uh, concerning the economic structure. Are they uh, very great ranges from the very wealthy to the very poor, and is there a middle class in, in such as the trading uh, centers and so forth? Well, what is interesting about this new 
democracy at birth is that is that they're long on ideas and when you get out into the villages you realize that uh, their dreams are very much further down the road. We took a long trip from Trinidad out into the country to visit the Ciarano people and these are Amazonian Indians. So we went down, down, down and traveled through a through a jungle to three hours in the back of a Toyota pickup and there were 18 people in the back of each pickup. It was a great adventure for many of our young people. We arrived at the village and they probably hadn't had visitors in months and months, but everybody put down what they were doing. They came to see us and they were uh, their big achievement that they had made was they had made a hill. They made a hill to be able to live and put houses so when there is flooding that they will not be flooded out. The people in this village live without running water, without electricity, without any, uh, any basic comforts that, that many people are become, become used to. Um, the poverty that is, that is stifling this whole democratic movement is that, is that people are, are sick, they have to go long, long ways to get antibiotics, a four hours drive to try and get some uh, penicillin to bring back to the village. So, so the news of the big, the big uh, plan of how to revitalize Bolivia has not reached the villagers yet, and it was it was quite clear. Also, a great majority of the people are uh, rural and, and living off the land. It's not a real urbanized country yet. Is it? It's uh, a little more than half of the people live in the country. And uh, they do not have anything like reservations. They mm -hmm. don't have any because of the the way the way uh, Bolivia was set up. There's no actual ownership of land by the native Indian people. So they're wrestling with these ideas. And they asked us about about land ownership and how is that a good thing for native people? Is how, how does it work? How do you keep the land productive? How do you keep it intact? So lots of land questions. More urbanization than I thought. Of those, uh, almost half the people that live in, in the cities or the urban area, what's their economic livelihood? Uh, how do they s uh, survive? There is some light manufacturing coming to Bolivia, and they make wonderful uh, cotton goods, textiles, and then, of course, the, the agricultural industry. But uh, mining is still is still a, a very large business, but but the price of metals has gone down throughout the world so so Bolivia is in a tough economic shape it, tough economic shape I was glad to see that the country of Bolivia had opened up an office of tourism in New York so they are trying to promote the country for for people to visit but very few people ever visit Bolivia one final question before we go back to Janelle from the people that went with you on this trip and uh, many of them already are very committed to occupations where they are, was there any discussion that m members of your organization or that were there or others that might come and spend a long period of time in Bolivia? Um, we, we all are trying to figure a way how can we go down there again and spend time. As they create their, their judicial system, I would like to be involved in that. My husband Ray, who is an attorney, was invited to be involved in the creation of a, of a court system. But again, the altitude is something yeah. that, oh, that's very hard to deal with. But there's a great deal of enthusiasm. The idea of sharing, sharing people to people kinds of uh, skills is, is something that won't cost very much. And I think that the people will really enjoy that. We want to have an exchange. We want to have Bolivians coming up to this area. We want to invite them to our reservations and to see how we do things, not as though it's better, but but to give them exposure to some new ideas. When that happens, I'm sure you'll make sure they come through this area. Certainly. <laughs> I'm sure they'll come to this program. <laughs> Janelle Berg. Well, I want to ask a series of little questions. Um, in a daily life of a Bolivian, um, there is some spirituality, I'm sure. Uh, what is likely to be the spiritual experiences of the Bolivians? In other words, religion. The, the <coughs> The dominant religion is 95% Catholic, and that is quite typical of Latin America. The missionaries came in and stayed for a long time. So that Catholicism is, is penetrated throughout the entire country. However, while we were there, we now know of other 
other uh, religions coming in, the Protestants and Mormons are there. Um, uh, of course, missionary work is taking place all over. And are but, there any native uh, religions yes. continuing to exist? And, and do they peacefully coexist? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we met a priest who was quite a, quite a wonderful fellow, a real character. And he, the way he worked in his, in his religious work with the native people is that is total acceptance of where they are spiritual, sp spiritually. So working hand in hand, if they could use some of the Catholic doctrine to achieve their happiness and their sense of contentedness, it was, it was, he was very open to many things. So, How about transportation? How did, you get, how did they get around? How does the Bolivian get around? Oh, they, Do they own cars? A lot of people fly. Uh, if people don't travel as much as we travel, I think that many people uh, living in the villages don't even get to the large town of Trinidad maybe maybe three or four times in their lifetime. So the people who travel are the professionals and tourists. Steve Sheen. Well, Jeannie, I know you weren't supposed to have much t much fun there it, because of the altitude. You couldn't eat much. You couldn't move around much. But uh, what did you do just for fun? I mean, it, it, was the food good? Did you get to see any theater, uh, shopping? Uh, the The beef in Bolivia is wonderful. It is, it is great beef. So we had a few steaks. And then the textiles. I loved shopping and of course the Bolivian, the Boliviano is of equal value to the American dollar. So I was able to pick up some good gifts uh, prior, prior to uh, the holidays for family. Rugs, basket work, dolls. I'm a doll collector mm -hmm. so I was real happy to come across these dolls. So shopping. <laughs> We're just about out of time. We have a little time left. Uh, what advice would you have for our viewers who might be thinking of a trip to somewhere like Bolivia? Uh, and if they were to go, uh, what would you recommend? I would recommend definitely go. Go to Latin America. Go to Bolivia, Peru, uh, Colombia. Uh, but try and have some contacts before you get down there. Use the American Embassy. That's what they're there for. Uh, move on their suggestions of, of who to visit and what to see. Get in touch with the Indigenous Fund and they could certainly get you into villages and give you some entree into, into village life which would be a very enriching cultural experience for any American. It's very important uh, not to just confine yourself to one city and so forth but to move around to get to know a country and its people. Right. On that note, on behalf of our panel and our staff, Jeannie Givens, we thank you for taking this time to talk to us about life in Bolivia. We've m very much enjoyed this interview with you, and we know that you'll come back in the future on uh, other travels that you have. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our program has been, as you know, a discussion of life in Bolivia with Jeannie Givens, and therefore we hope you've enjoyed our program. We'd like for you to be with us again next week at this same time, and we will discuss yet another subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.